I'd like to welcome everyone to MTRI's November SIPAC seminar. But before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are meeting here today in Gespawik, one of the seven districts of Mi'kma'ki, homeland of the Mi'kmaq people. And I want to also acknowledge uh, the treaties of peace and friendship and thank the Mi'kmaq people for their generosity in sharing their homeland with us. So for anyone who is not aware, the Mersey Tobiatic Research Institute is a research-based nonprofit nestled in southwest Nova Scotia near Kejimakujik National Park and Historic Site. And our mission is to promote, conserve, and sustain biodiversity in Gaspawik and beyond. And today I am very pleased to introduce Hannah Martin and Cody Chapman. Hannah works for the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq, and Cody is currently working on his Master's of Science at Acadia University. I'd like to remind anyone that if they have any questions, during the presentations, they can uh, add them to the chat bar and Hannah and Cody can address them either during or after the talk. So, thank you. Yay. Um, I was gonna do uh, a land acknowledgement, but you beat me to it. <laughs> thank you. You control Cody. Yourself, Hannah? Sorry. Are you controlling it? Yeah. So I'm just going to mute myself and then um, just give me a wave or um, whatever works for you when you want me to change the slide. Sure. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Is it working? Are you ready to start? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah sorry. I, I thought it was I'm frozen. I'm so sorry, Cody. <laughs> All right. No, I'm sorry. I thought it was frozen. Okay. It was freezing on me earlier, so I'm just used to it freezing. Okay, so I realize a lot of people probably already have a pretty decent background um, on some of these things I'm going to talk about at first, um, but just in case people don't, I'm going to kind of touch on some of the, the basics. Um, so all of my research that I'm conducting um, on, on Hemlock Willie Delgid is being carried out um, in areas in and around kind of the southwest Nova Biosphere Reserve uh, portion of the Acadian Forest. Um, so the Acadian Forest, for those who don't know, is present throughout um, all of Atlantic Canada, um, parts of the northeastern United States, as well as some parts of Quebec. Um, it is considered to be an endangered forest type globally due uh, to overharvesting for lumber, historical clearing for agriculture, and unfortunately now um, due to the continued spread of invasive species um, like hemlock woolly delgid and emerald ash borer. The forests of southwestern Nova Scotia are among the most biodiverse habitats in eastern Canada um, and they're home to species found nowhere else in the region um, in a whole range of both provincially and federally listed species at risk um, as well as a number of species of conservation concern. Um, the Acadian forest in southwestern Nova Scotia uh, is frequently characterized by a large hemlock component um, and this com uh, comprises much of the forest of uh, the Southwest Nova Biosphere Reserve. Um, I was just chatting with uh, staff at Kejimkujik this morning, um, and I learned that the forest in Kejimkujik is nine to 10% um, hemlock dominated component, which is fairly significant uh, when you consider the size of a landscape like Kejimkujik. Now I have a question for, uh, for Chad. I'm wondering if I can get rid of the boxes on the side of my screen because they're covering part of my uh, slide. Uh, boxes, like maybe the video. Oh, never mind. Never oh, mind. Okay. I thought you could control that, but I got it. Okay. Um, so this is a map of the Southwest Nova uh, Biosphere Reserve in green. Um, the gray, the purpley gray areas with uh, stripes are protected areas, and the two red dots, one above Digby and one above Shelburne. Um, are my two research sites at Sisibu Falls and McKay Lakes, um, and they both fall within uh, protected areas. Um, you're good to go now, Hannah. So this is a uh, screen grab that I just took off of um, citizen science kind of biodiversity um, 
uh, 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 effort like iNaturalist. This is a uh, the area around Kejimkujik and kind of shows parts of Toby Attic and Rosignol. Um, and each of these little pins on the map uh, shows the occurrence of either a species at risk or a species of conservation concern. Um, and I just wanted to show this just to kind of illustrate the significance of the forest in this area um, for these species. Um, and this is just through a citizen science application. Um, and we can see this much, it's, it's a very uh, significant area. Um, yeah, that's good to go. Um, so Eastern hemlock, as I mentioned, is a crucial component of the Acadian forest. Um, it's a long lived tree. It can live to be 300 years or more. There are trees that old on the hemlock, hemlocks and hardwood trail in Kejimkujik. Um, if you haven't uh, checked out that trail, I highly recommend it. There's some very impressive hemlock there. Um, and in regions where hemlock is a dominant canopy species, it's considered to be keystone. It has a significant cooling effect on forest streams, um, which is important for a range of different fish, including brook trout. Um, the canopy maintains a cool, dark, damp microclimate on the forest floor, which benefits um, a lot of the species I'm going to talk about later in my presentation, but also things like uh, uh, spring peepers and salamanders um, and, of course, all kinds of insects. It provides year-round food and habitat for birds, mammals, and invertebrates. Um, the cones of hemlock tree are an important source of food for things like American red squirrel through the harsh winter months. Um, and interestingly, there's an 1813 account that I came across while doing some research for my project um, from the area that is now Kushibuguak in New Brunswick um, of, a, of a, a, an early settler was traveling through the forest with some Mi'kmaq guides um, and they were traveling through a hemlock dominated forest using the hemlock trees themselves um, to orient themselves. Um, and when the guide asked how they knew um, which way they were going based on the hemlock, they pointed out that the top branches of these old hemlock trees uh, we're always pointing to the south, um, which I thought was really cool. I, I didn't know this. Um, yeah, um, you're good to go, Hannah. And now we get to the villain. Um, so hemlock woolly adelgid is indigenous to Asia, uh, where the native hemlock species have a natural resistance and they have natural enemies um, that are abundant. Um, they keep the population in check. Um, hemlock woolly adelgid is also present in Western North America. Um, it's thought to have been present there for several thousand years, uh, but it's not considered to be a major issue because it's been present for so long that there's now a natural host resistant in Western hemlock, um, and there are now uh, abundant natural enemies uh, to hemlock woolly adelgid. However, in 1951, a hemlock woolly adelgid lineage originally native to Japan uh, was detected in Virginia, um, and since then it has spread to 18 other uh, American states and two Canadian provinces, um, Ontario and Nova Scotia. And as of 2015, um, hemlock woolly adelgid was present in 90% of Eastern hemlock's geographic range globally. Um, and this number is even, is even higher now because um, of course 2015 is before it was officially recorded in Nova Scotia. Ontario uh, eradicated the initial waves of population, uh, the initial populations of hemlock woolly adelgid detected uh, in 2012 and 2013, um, but last year two more populations were found. Um, and it, it is a present in, in uh, nearby American states to Ontario, so it'll probably sadly um, keep returning. Um, you're good to go, Hannah. Here's another screen grab I took from iNaturalist, um, just because it, it really shows the, uh, the distribution of hemlock woolly adelgid in Nova Scotia. These are all confirmed hemlock woolly adelgid sightings through um, citizen science uh, uploads. Um, so hemlock woolly adelgid was first recorded in Nova Scotia. <laughs> Nick likes INAT. Um, <laughs> Hemlock Willie Delta was first recorded in Nova Scotia in 2017. And sadly, it's now been confirmed in Digby, Queens, Shelburne, Yarmouth, Annapolis, and as of uh, spring 2020, Lunenburg counties. Um, and it was actually found something like 400 meters over the county line in Lunenburg. Um, so now these areas are all uh, within what's called a Hemlock Willie Delta regulated area uh, where limitations are in place for moving hemlock material uh, out, out of these areas. So hemlock woolly adelgid are known to spread via infested timber, um, but they can also spread, uh, we think through wildlife, potentially caught on something even as simple as bird feathers, um, and even via the wind. It's, it's, it moves very easily and it's very hard to control. And sadly, it's extremely destructive. It causes severe defoliation. Um, and unlike emerald ash borer, which will only infest ash with a diameter over, uh, over a certain size, Hemlock woolly adelgid will infest uh, hemlocks of any size from a seedling right up to uh, an old growth mature tree. 
and it can cause significant hemlock dieback within three to five years. Um, and sadly, one of the sites that I'm, I'm doing my research at, um, I've been told has declined quite a bit, even since it's been known to other people on the research team. Um, you can go now, Hannah. So there's a couple different uh, methods to combat something like hemlock woolly adelgid. And ultimately the long-term goal is to provide a natural enemy for hemlock woolly adelgid, something called biocontrol. Um, and research into this is ongoing. Uh, right now, uh, researchers are looking at several species of beetle uh, within the genus Laracobius. Um, and Laracobius is, is uh, within a family of beetles called the tooth-necked fungus beetles. Um, but they are the only one of the, the genera within that family um, that actually feeds on adelgids. The other three uh, relatives of that type of beetle uh, feed on fungus, uh, which I think is kind of cool. Um, so most of the beetles that they're researching are not native to um, Nova Scotia. Um, and, and some of them are currently actually being um, prepared for uh, uh, release within parts of the United States. Um, there's also some research investigating native predators already present in Canadian ecosystems, particularly there's a species beetle native to um, British Columbia that um, they're, they're looking at for uh, releasing into hemlock woolly delgid infested stands. However, short term uh, efforts to control hemlock woolly delgid dieback uh, involve insecticide treatments um, within the infested stands. And that's what my research is looking at. So the next slide. So there's two commonly used chemical controls for hemlock woolly delgid. Uh, dinotepheron and something called imidacloprid. And for my research and what uh, we're looking at using in Nova Scotia going forward is imidacloprid. So imidacloprid acts as, as a systemic insecticide, um, which means it has effects on the central nervous systems of insects. It's lethal to insects upon consumption. It, it gets absorbed through their stomach and it blocks certain neural pathways. Um, this chemical itself is very common. Um, it is the most common agricultural uh, agriculturally used insecticide. So it's already being used in abundant on our lands, uh, in abundance on our landscape. Um, and it has a range of uses from, um, uh, from agricultural and arboricultural to veterinary. Um, it's actually the exact same chemical that you would use for something like a, a flea repellent that you put on your dog um, that would have imidacloprid in it. Um, compared to other insecticides, imidacloprid is effective at very low concentrations. Um, so it actually, the, the invention of imidacloprid originally allowed for um, farmers to phase out some more harmful chemicals because they didn't need to use as much of it to have the same effects. Um, and it's effective at killing hemlock woolly delgid and other insects that it comes into contact with. And I think we had a question on this slide. So Ali V is asking, is imidacloprid in the same family as neonics? Yes, uh, imidacloprid is a neonicotinoid, um, which of course brings to mind all kinds of uh, horrible images of pollinators dying in, in fields. Um, but this, I'll, I'll talk about our injection method a little bit later, um, but what we're doing is on a much smaller scale than what you would see in agriculture. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any pictures of what we did, um, but I will talk about it a little bit later. If you wanna skip ahead now, Hannah. So my research. As I mentioned earlier, it was conducted at two sites, uh, one in Sisibu Falls uh, in Digby County, and the other in McKay Lakes in Shelburne County, both on uh, provincial protected wilderness areas. Um, hemlock at both sites were treated with imidacloprid in October, 2020, and my project aims to assess the non-target effects of imidacloprid on the native forest arthropod community. Um, so we're gonna be investigating the effects to communities in the various for forest strata. So we, we're looking at insects on the forest floor, the sub canopy layer and the canopy layer, um, just because you're gonna have uh, different species living in these different forest strata. We aim to compare overall arthropod diversity and abundance at each site before and after imidacloprid injection, just so we, we have a full understanding of, of the, the non-target implications of using something like uh, imidacloprid in, in a complex old forest system. Um, good for the next slide now. So here's a map of one of my research sites. Uh, this is the McKay Lakes uh, site setup. So this is our experimental design. We have four uh, plots at each site and each plot is broken down into two subplots. Um, each subplot receives its own suite of traps um, and each subplot um, is, is a target area for our ground vegetation inventories as well. So uh, when they treated our, our plots, one of the subplots within each plot uh, received imidacloprid injection and the other one did not. 
Um, so this will allow us to compare treated versus, un versus untreated even two years out. Um, but we gather data from all of them in the pre-treatment year in 2020. Uh, and the purple just shows the boundary of the protected area. You're good to go now, Hannah. So here's a picture of what the canopy trap looks like on the, on the left. Uh, that green trap is the funnel, it's called a uh, Lindgren funnel trap. And the bags on it are actually lures. They're, they're something that's very attractive to certain groups of insects. Um, and in our case in particular, we are looking at beetles. Um, so they're attracted to it. Um, it hangs up in the forest canopy. And when they land on the funnels, there's kind of like a chalky uh, coating on the inside of the funnels. Uh, the, the insects can't grip on it and they slide down, uh, fall through a hole through the middle of all the funnels and land in that little white collection cup at the bottom, um, which is filled with um, something called propylene glycol, um, which is a uh, non-toxic substance. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's actually considered food grade. It is considered edible in small quantities. Um, and it's just, it acts as an insect preservative in the summer heat. Um, so we installed our uh, insect funnel traps in uh, early July 2020, and they stayed up in the canopy um, until the end of September. Um, and uh, me and uh, a couple of other uh, alternating people on the research team um, went out roughly every two weeks um, to, to do a collection um, of what's in the white cup at the bottom of each trap. Just because if we left them out too long, the heat starts to do things to the insects and they actually um, the concentration of the, the preservative will change due to fluids being released from the insects themselves. Um, these traps provided samples of the background arthropod biodiversity in our traps, uh, in, in our plots prior to imidacloprid injection. Um, and all of our samples from the canopy and sub canopy traps were sent to uh, the Canadian Forest Service uh, in Fredericton where identification work is now ongoing. Um, but for the most part, it was beetles that were caught in these traps because of our lures, things like longhorn beetles and uh, uh, carabid beetles. Um, you can skip now, Hannah. So the black trap on the left, that is our sub canopy or intercept trap. Um, it's the same idea as the canopy trap, um, except it's, it's just, it's black. Um, and we put lures on it, same idea. And except in this picture, you can actually see the chalky coating um, on the insides of the funnels. Um, that white on the trap is actually a, a substance that was put there so the insects slip um, and fall into the collection cup. And on the right is a picture of a collection cup um, after it had been left uh, collecting for two weeks. You can see it's full of all kinds of different, mainly beetles in there. Um, I, you can see some long antennae from the um, things like Sawyer beetles and uh, boring beetles in there. And that is propylene glycol, that solution. I think we're I think I have a video of how we get the, uh, if, it, if it allows us to play it in the next slide, that shows how we get the canopy traps installed. Um, we use something called a big shot slingshot. Um, we get the slow motion version, I guess. So basically it's a weight tied to the end of a rope um, and it's launched up and over a branch that we want to attach a canopy trap to. Um, and the weight brings it back down the other side. Um, and then we just replace the weight with a uh, canopy trap. And then we can hoist it up into the tree, tie it off on another tree nearby, and it will stay uh, secure for the entire summer, provided you don't get storms that are too rough on it. And also Gavin had a really accurate shot for getting it on the branches that we were looking for. I don't know how he got it so good. Um, so for our forest floor sampling, we did something called a, uh, we used something called a pitfall trap. Um, there's a picture of it on the left. Um, so it's basically a plastic cup that is set into the ground with a lip around the top of the cup that's uh, kind of flush with the forest floor. Um, and there's a smaller uh, cup, a plastic cup. You can just see the top of it inside the trap there that is filled with propylene glycol. Um, and again, uh, it preserved the insects until we could come collect them every, roughly every two weeks. Um, so anything that's kind of marching along the forest floor would just drop into there passively. There was no lures or anything used with this trap. Um, and again, we, we installed them in early July and we, we took them out in late September. Um, so we, we installed our pitfall traps on a, a transect to either side of a healthy hemlock within each plot. So the idea was that we could uh, analyze the distance effects from a treated, uh, tree treated with imidacloprid 
at uh, half a meter out and one and a half meters out, both to the north and the south of the tree. Um, just in case there are any uh, differential impacts close to the tree, um, where we'll be able to pick them up hopefully with a, a design like this. Um, so these traps also sampled background arthropod biodiversity um, at our uh, four different locations along the transect, um, and they'll allow us to assess potential distance effects. And the pitfall trap samples are currently being identified at Acadia by me. Um, so that's my winter, I'm going through all these samples um, and identifying um, everything that we caught in these traps. We caught lots of ants, uh, ground beetles, um, and more spiders than I expected. Um, and this is, unfortunately, this was the only picture I had uh, that's a close-up of one of our pitfall trap setups. Um, we, there is a lid that goes over it that has a grate along the edge to keep things out like salamanders and small mammals um, because they will drop in and, and uh, we don't want that, of course. So most of the traps did have a grate keeping them out. At the very end of our setup, uh, we did run out. So I used, uh, it's another trap just turned upside down on top of it just to keep the rain out. Um, and we did later replace them with the graded lid, um, which I think you can see in the next slide. Um, if you want to skip ahead, Hannah. So I tried to show a set, uh, our, our transact setup uh, on the picture on the left. These are our pitfall traps. And you can see the, the closest picture to the bottom right, or the closest trap to the bottom right has the grate on it to keep uh, small vertebrates out. Um, however, you'll notice these traps are not um, uh, in the ground. They've been pulled out of the ground. Um, and I mentioned earlier that uh, propylene glycol is food grade. It's also apparently sweet. Um, and so we did, we, did, we did have the occasional bear um, pull our traps out and actually eat our samples and it ate the glycol, um, which again is non-toxic. It's considered food grade. Um, but it was, it was an issue that we had to deal with at a couple of our sites. And that's, of course, a bear track on the right that was found quite near to uh, where all these pitfall traps have been pulled out of the ground. I think there was a mother and a cub hanging out at uh, one of our sites for, for a couple of weeks there. Um, and if, I also did a, a ground vegetation sample uh, program. So once per month through the summer from July through uh, September, uh, I made an inventory of the ground plants inhabiting each subplot at our sites. Um, so you'll remember there's four plots, two subplots per plot. So I did a total of eight uh, ground vegetation inventories every month at each site. This data will give us a better understanding of the vegetation communities that benefit from the uh, conditions I mentioned earlier, um, the, the dark, moist uh, ground uh, micro, micro habitats created by the hemlocks. Um, and it also gave us a better idea of potential pollinator interactions that uh, are happening in these forests. Um, of course, if, if there's plants that are attracting pollinators into the, um, these hemlock dominated habitats, uh, we would notice them with these surveys is the idea. Um, and of course, these surveys were randomized. They were repeated six times. Um, so we, ha we had a, a, a hopefully quite a representative setup. Um, and our ground vegetation data that we collected will be shared with the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq to aid with their efforts um, to better understand the abundance of traditional medicinal species um, in an old forest habitat, um, which it has implications for something like um, the MFI project going on with the Confederacy. Uh, yeah, and here's some examples of the sort of ground vegetation that you would expect to find in a hemlock dominated forest. Um, these are all pictures I took in, in my, uh, my quadrats. Um, so you have your partridge berry in the top left, you have a mediola cucumber root in the bottom left, um, there's also a club moss in the middle and a mountain wood sorrel on the right. Yes, Nally is reminding everyone that MFI that I just mentioned stands for the uh, Mi'kmaq Forestry Initiative. Um, thank you, Ali. So um, there's, there was a major concern, at least um, for the people who weren't uh, going home at night to an area that was within the Hemlock Willie Delgid regulated area. Um, for example, I was leaving these field sites and I was going uh, to places like Wolfville where there is no hemlock woolly delgid yet, or to places even like Truro where uh, hemlock woolly delgid hopefully remains a little ways away at this time. So I, I got some advice from uh, uh, staff at Kajim Kujik. I was told to act like it's a communicable disease because essentially it is. Um, and I, re I really took this to heart because I don't want to spread hemlock woolly delgid. Um, so I, I kept a lint roller in the back of my car um, I would always uh, try to lint all the visible woolly adelgids off of my clothes, off of my field gear before I got in the car. Um, because when you're going through a forest 
it, that's uh, infested with hemlock woolly delgid, uh, you're, you can't help it. You're hitting branches and they're falling. It's, it's almost, you can't avoid it. They're, they're going up your nose. They're all over you. Um, so there's no avoiding getting them on you. And they're so small, you barely see them. Um, so you, you just have to keep in mind that you're probably contaminated with them if you leave a forest that's uh, infested with hemlock woolly delgid. Um, so I made a point not to stop. The car near areas where I could see that hemlock was present um, and the equipment that I used uh, to, while doing fieldwork at one of the infested sites, I wouldn't use it for several days to several weeks afterwards. Um, and <laughs> I did something that I named myself hot car sterilization. I would just leave my equipment in my car in the middle of the summer for a couple of weeks after each field trip. Um, uh, and my car would get very hot, of course, in the sun. And uh, the idea was that that would sterilize it, uh, sterilize the adults. And time management was a very important thing as well, um, especially where you're working with different people's schedules. If you have summer students coming out with you, for example, and you know they have to be back um, in, in an uh, area that's, with, that's outside of the regulated uh, area, I would make sure to get them back home in time um, so that they could uh, change their clothes and shower before going out to whatever it is they had to do that evening. Um, so th this made it hard for time management if I was in the middle of uh, a plot in, in Shelburne County at McKay Lakes and I had to be back uh, in, to Truro for six o'clock. I would have to leave extra early just to make sure that uh, the summer students would be able to uh, clean themselves if I knew that they had plans to go to Victoria Park, uh, for example, which is full of hemlock in Colchester County. I didn't want them to spread really adult. It. So um, I tried my best to um, put my own concerns to rest with that. Um, you can go to the next slide now. So as I mentioned, um, in October 2020, half of our research plots at each site were treated with imidacloprid um, by trained professionals from the Canadian Forest Service. Um, this is a map of our Sisibu Falls site, and it looks like they're close to the watercourse, that's the Sisibu River, but they're not. That is that it's just the scale of the map that there's uh, several uh, meters back from the water's edge. Um, we, of course, we did not uh, use imidacloprid that close to the water, close to the water's edge. Um, the treatment was carried out via an injection directly into each tree's vascular tissue. Um, so a hole was bored in the bark of the hemlock that we were treating, um, and the imidacloprid was uh, injected right into the tree. It was not sprayed in the environment. Um, there was very little to no actual leakage of the imidacloprid into the environment. Um, it was put directly into the tree. Um, and the, the, I unfortunately wasn't able to attend on the days that they did the treatments. Um, but I've been told that the, it was a success and that the imidacloprid uh, readily absorbed into the tree's vascular tissue. Um, I, I was told that uh, you could, there was a visible wetness, of course, when you first apply the imidacloprid. Within a, a few hours, it was dry again. Um, so th there was very, we expect there was very minimal um, environmental exposure to the imidacloprid. The other half of our research plots, as I mentioned, were left untreated. Um, and these plots will serve as a control with which the treated plots can be compared uh, next year after we get our 2021 biodiversity data. Um, yeah. Which brings us to what we're doing next year. So we're going to put all of our traps uh, back out exactly the same way we did last year. So we have our, our pitfall traps, our sub canopy traps, and our canopy traps. Um, they will be put out from July 2021 to um, end of September 2021. And I will again conduct my vegetation inventories once per month. Um, and a final arthropod diversity inventory will be generated representing um, both sites and all plots uh, for 2020 and again for 2021. Um, so this will allow us to analyze for a number of different things, um, namely things like changes to species richness at each site between 2020 and 2021. Of course, the treatment of imidacloprid happened between that. Um, so we want to know, did that influence uh, species richness? Did it influence species abundance? Uh, and we could do this for both plants and arthropods. Um, we could also analyze for things like differences in species richness, half a meter from a tree to tree versus a meter and a half away uh, to analyze things like distance effects, uh, as well as differential effects of treatment on the communities inhabiting the various forest strata. Um, are communities in one layer more prone to the non-target effects of imidacloprid than those in another? Um, we're hoping to be able to pick uh, any of these things up with our, with our uh, experimental design. And we can go to the next slide now. So why does this research matter? Hemlock woolly delgid is going to continue spreading and our hemlock forests have already begun declining. Um, the, the Sisibu Falls site 
as I mentioned, has uh, I've been told I I just became familiar with it this year, but I've been told that it has declined um, since it's been known to some of the other people on the research team. This means that the crucial role hemlocks play in maintaining our biodiversity is going to be lost, um, and our forest ecosystems are going to change, and in some ways they may change irreversibly. Given the absence of a proven biocontrol method, um, the only means to preserve some of the remaining hemlock forests in southwestern Nova Scotia is through the use of insecticides like imidacloprid at this time. Before widespread chemical treatment, we must ensure that we understand the non-target effects that we can anticipate in a greater forest ecosystem. We can't just go in there blindly applying a chemical in, in a uh, sensitive and complex forest ecosystem, which is why we're doing this research. Um, the results of this project will provide insight to forest uh, preservation efforts at the federal, provincial, and municipal levels. And of course, project partners for this um, involve, uh, there's, we have their logos at the beginning, but of course it's Parks Canada, um, Canadian Forestry Service, uh, 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 they're, they're all uh, playing a major role in this project. Um, so we're hoping to be able to help them out with this, the data that we generate from this. And so hopefully end this on a bit of a positive note. Um, so it's, of course, it's too early to talk about um, our assessment of the non-target effects. We don't have our second year's worth of data yet. Uh, we don't know if there's any effects to talk about yet. However, um, within our first year of, of uh, collection, uh, we did uh, manage to uh, collect a first species record of a species that was previously not known from Nova Scotia. Um, it's a cymindus, uh, which is a type of ground beetle. Um, and the picture on the top is a cymindus beetle, not the species that we caught, but it gives you uh, an idea of what it would look like. Um, and this was caught in one of our canopy traps, I believe, um, in Digby County. And we also uh, picked up a uh, new occurrence record of a species that's uh, of conservation significance, the, the Nova Scotia false foxglove, uh, pictured at the bottom, very blurry picture. Um, this occurrence was confirmed by professionals with the Atlantic Canada Conservation Data Center. And of course, um, this record has been submitted to them um, and will help them to um, uh, analyze you know, the range of the species and uh, inform conservation management for false foxglove in the future, should it become relevant. And that is my last slide, I believe, aside from, yes, just showing everybody that I didn't take those insect pictures. Um, and if I went too quick through something, please ask me to clarify. I'll try my best. Or if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. If not, I know Hannah has some really cool things to talk about. I can't actually see the chat bar, so because um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm screen sharing. But um, is there any questions that you want to answer first? Cody, before I start my presentation? Uh, no, no new questions. Okay. Um, so when I present, if there is a, a question, maybe Chad, if you don't mind um, just uh, maybe interrupting me and let, letting me know so I can answer that question. I don't mind um, that at all. Um, yeah, yeah, I can do that. Okay, perfect. Okay, great. I don't know if... Um, is it showing my face at all? I can't really tell. I guess if I show the, the sidebar, maybe, but. Um, I guess it doesn't matter, but OK. So um, hi, everyone. Gwe, Wele Walog, Ninda Lewisi, Hannah Godalan Maltai, Ninda Lewi, Daha Miguchk, Migmagi, Wiki, Wigo, Begwadig, First Nation, Aha, Eb, Blue Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Hannah Martin. I am from the traditional unceded territory of my ancestors, the Mi'kmaq. Um, I grew up in Taha Maguchk, Tatamagush, which is on the North Shore. Um, this place is uh, in, the, in the Mi'kmaq translation, it means the place where the water is barred by sand or the little crossing place. So at low tide, you can uh, you can see the sandbars that zigzag across the bay. Uh, so I grew up in Tatamagush um, and I'm a member of the Millbrook First Nation community. Um, I currently work with the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq and uh, my position here is as the Nujigolo Dohadajig Earthkeeper Project uh, Coordinator. 
So previously known as the Land Guardian Network, uh, this is uh, basically a, a stewardship program across Nova Scotia that we're developing um, to get Mi'kmaq community members on the ground, doing boots on the ground work um, across Nova Scotia. So we're working with the Unamagi Institute for Natural Resources um, to get this program on the go. Uh, currently we're in our pilot phase. Um, so that looks a lot like uh, just developing the network and also building a case for future funding with Environment Canada. So uh, I've been kind of juggling a couple different roles that looks like uh, working with each of our communities to start developing capacity um, for our program in each of the communities and also getting out on the land quite a bit myself. So it's definitely been an exciting role. I've been with the Confederacy for just over a year now. And I also had the pleasure of working with Cody when he was uh, with us at CMM, which has been uh, really great. And so I am really happy to be able to present with uh, him tonight alongside him. And I just want to uh, thank MTRI for the opportunity. Um, and uh, I'm happy to share with you folks um, this evening some of the work I've been doing. Um, I'm going to talk tonight about uh, the black ash file that we have at Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the emerald ash borer, which uh, most of us know um, has recently infested uh, Nova Scotia. Uh, we have a, our first sighting of emerald ash borer was in Bedford. So it's, it's, it's here now. Um, and so this evening, I'm going to pretty much frame uh, the work that I've been doing around uh, my own life as a Mi'kmaq woman and also as a traditional basket maker. So uh, I'm gonna start out a little bit tonight just speaking to you about um, our culture um, and then later I'll kind of get into EAP and black ash and how all of those things connect. Um, so I, uh, Chad, can you just let me know if, is it showing me in the corner right now while I'm speaking? Yes, it is. Okay, because I actually see you. <laughs> okay. Awesome, okay, cool, great. Um, so the first thing I wanted to chat about tonight um, is uh, the importance of Wisco or black ash to the Mi'kmaq community. Um, so I myself am a basket maker. I was taught by uh, my grandmother and her name is Jean Johnson and she's uh, featured in the top right corner. Um, this is a photo of myself and my grandmother working on a fishing creel for my brother um, for a Christmas gift last winter. So um, I first started basket making in I think probably 2011, so about a decade now, which is funny to say, but um, I've been uh, basket making for over uh, 10 years now. Um, it actually started for me during a heritage month project in grade eight. And I knew that my grandmother was a basket maker and I didn't grow up knowing this, uh, this skill at all. So. Um, I approached my grandma and I was like, you know, I have this project I have to do. Um, would you mind teaching me how to make baskets and teaching me about baskets and the importance of that in our culture? And she said yes. And so I spent the day with her. My dad came along and he was the photographer. And uh, my grandmother, you know, brought out her her awls, her um, splicers to help with the the. Um, uh, basically the sizing of the splint. Um, and I'm gonna show you some of my stuff here. I have a big mess on my kitchen table here of, uh, of ash. So I can show you some of that um, too. But uh, yeah, so she brought out all her tools, um, which were like so foreign to me. I'd never seen basket making tools in my life. And so it was just like the coolest thing. I was actually learning this from my grandma. And so she brought out all her tools and her basket making books and some old pictures of family. And, uh, you know, we actually, it was a picture that looked quite like the one that was on the screen, but um, we sat down that day and my dad documented my grandmother and I making my first basket with her. Uh, and the basket was um, quite similar to this one. Um, hopefully you can see this, but um, so this is just a little, uh, what could be a fancy basket, um, but the one that I made with her uh, didn't have a handle um, and it was, maybe not quite as nice. Um, but yeah, so that was my first introduction to basket making. Uh, my grandmother taught me about the importance of basket making. Um, back then, it was really a, a huge part of our economy as Mi'kmaq people, um, before contact and post-contact. Um, 
So specifically, you know, post contact, uh, when our when our settler relations came here, um, we started engaging in a huge market, uh, especially around um, harvesting. So um, in the valley, um, Gerald uh, Gerald Tony Senior actually talks about this in our documentary on Wisco.ca, which was a, a project developed by one of our own um, uh, staff members, Anthony King, and our team. Um, so Gerald uh, talked about how in the 1950s, um, his family could produce 100 apple baskets a day. And back then, uh, they were selling them for a dollar a piece. So back then, that was a little bit more money than it is today. Um, and I think he said that his family was um, a family of 11. I think, you know, I don't, uh, so that would mean, I guess, nine children. Um, and so he said when they were making baskets at their house, it was like a basket factory. Um, and that image is just so cool in my head to think that it was such a huge production um, that that was the main source of income for his family. Um, and that was really the reality for all of our families back then. Um, I myself come from a basket making family. Uh, my grandmother, Jean, learned from her mom. Uh, her name was Mary Silliboy and uh, her mother was, uh, I believe, Elizabeth Christmas. So uh, so it, it's something that's been passed down in my family for generations. Um, of course, it's very significant um, economically. Um, we didn't just make baskets. Uh, my grandmother's father, Andrew, was a tool maker. Uh, he made axe handles. Uh, you know, we, we made baseball bats, not my family, but Mi'kmaq people made baseball bats, snowshoes, um, jikamahans, which are, uh, they're like a piece of ash and the end is pounded. So it looks like a fan. And when you hit it on your hand, it's like a musical instrument. So, uh, you know, these are all, all these things were really a big important part of our economy. Um, but furthermore, they were a really important part of our culture as Mi'kmaq people. Um, when we do communal activities, um, we are bonding with our families. Uh, we're telling stories. Um, you know, uh, we're doing a lot of healing work. Um, uh, you know, it's what I call intergenerational Mi'kmaq knowledge transmission. Um, so, you know, one big thing that I, I kind of, uh, you know, carry with me is, you know, we talk a lot about the intergenerational trauma that we have as Mi'kmaq people. But I think that things like basket making and things like uh, reclaiming our language, all those things are uh, ways that we're doing intergenerational healing. So um, all these things are really important today. Um, you know, our family structure really was built around these communal activities. The women primarily made baskets, but men did too. Um, and really big baskets, uh, the binding around them had to be really strong. So um, the binding uh, would be, I can show you a basket here. I'm just gonna end up talking about baskets all night. So uh, this is a basket that I just made uh, a couple weeks ago. And you can see that on the top, um, you basically have like a raw edge and the inner circle of that basket um, has a really thick piece of ash. And you have to be really strong to bind uh, the top together um, so the basket doesn't fall apart. So a lot of times um, men helped with that part. Um, and so it really was a family activity. Uh, so yeah, um, to wrap up this slide, uh, basket making was really a cornerstone of Mi'kmaq culture. And the reason why this applies to my presentation tonight is because um, the most optimal wood for basket making was black ash. And uh, white ash is a very close second, but um, the big difference between white and black ash is because black ash grows so nice and slow, it has really thin rings, um, which are really good um, for you know, really fine work, fine basket work. Um, and black ash is very strong and it's also very flexible. So you can take like a really nice thick piece and it really doesn't take long when you're soaking it in water for it to be uh, nice and pliable for whatever you need it for. So um, so I'll kind of like uh, basically just uh, transition into talking about more about black ash um, from kind of a, an ecological and some more cultural uh, standpoint. So black ash is one of uh, three native ash species in Mi'kmaq, um, Nova Scotia specifically. Um, there's estimated to be only about a thousand trees left in Nova Scotia. Um, and it's ranked as threatened in Nova Scotia. Um, it inhabits forested wetlands, riparian areas, and floodplains. Um, black ash, I think there's a, there's a you know, not a misconception, but I think 
um, you know, we think of black ash as growing the best in wetlands. But uh, one thing that has been taught to me through my work at CMM is that uh, one of the reasons that it might be growing in the middle of wetlands is actually because it's a really resilient species and it doesn't do well with competition. So black ash will grow in places where other species won't. So you'll get like a nice wetland and uh, you'll see like your red maple and your um, your alder. Um, and then, you know, when you get right into the, uh, the middle of that wetland, you'll see the black ash growing on hummocks where the alder and the red maple just aren't. So they're very resilient species. Um, this is one of the reasons why I really love them. Um, I've, I've been really privileged to be able to work with this species through my work at CMM uh, as someone who's been uh, kind of taking up a lot of the responsibilities with our black ash file. Um, so yeah, it's strong and flexible, uh, really great for basketry and tool production. Um, it has struggled to survive in great numbers throughout our history. Um, so, you know, there is kind of a debate or a conversation around, you know, how much did Mi'kmaq actually use black ash in, in the past? Um, definitely more than we do today. And a big reason for that, which I'll talk about, I think, in the next slide, is some of the, um, the reasons for its decline. And because black ash was just such a great material, um, it was used a lot in barrel making um, post-contact. So it was being used for barrels with a lot of our exports and uh, due to overharvest, that's been one of the reasons for its decline in the early years. So um, it's it can take up to eight seasons for a tree to produce seed. So when you do have a seed bearing tree or a seed bearing year, you really have to jump on it and make sure that you uh, collect as much seed as possible. Um, and what we part of our project at CMM has been collecting seed over the past uh, couple of decades and uh, sending it to the National Tree Center, so, or the National Seed Center. Um, it can take about 55 years for a black ash or a wisco to reach its optimum side, size for craft wood. So it's actually, you know, it's a very slow growing tree, um, which is part of what makes it optimal, but um, it's, it makes it a bit trickier in terms of, um, I guess, conserving the species for craft wood. Um, black, uh, white, white ash, again, as I mentioned, is, is also a really great wood to use, but its strips are often not as small enough to do delicate work. So some of the work that CMM has done to conserve Wisco, um, we first started to harvest seed in 1999 when Alton Hudson was leading um, our file. Uh, we harvested from Kejimikujik in Caledonia, where there's a really beautiful old growth stand. Um, we've been conducting surveys to document previously unrecorded WISCO in the province and submitting that uh, data to the ACCDC, the Atlantic uh, Canada Conservation Data Center. Um, we've been collecting seeds from reproductive trees and submitting them to the seed center, as I mentioned. Uh, we've also been working to create plantation sites with the trees that we have grown from those seeds uh, and establishing new stands in protected areas. One of the most recent ones uh, that we did was a uh, new plantation in the Shubenacadie Wildlife Park, um, which we are working with the Shubenacadie Wildlife Park to uh, put together a plaque to honor the Wisco, which uh, hopefully we'll be able to see this year, which, is, which will be great um, in terms of our education and outreach. Um, we've also been using surveys and traps uh, for EAB in uh, collaboration with um, the Canadian Food Inspect Inspection Agency um, to monitor the spread of EAB. And we've also been facilitating public outreach events to raise awareness of black ash and EAB infestations. Um, this year, we worked in collaboration with Department of Lands and Forestry, and we actually were able to collect 10,000 seeds that are viable um, from a site in Oxford Junction, which was a really great success and also a testament to uh, teamwork and uh, treaty relations with, with the province, which is awesome. Uh, this year, we also had uh, another AFSAR uh, proposal approved, which is gonna allow us to continue to do uh, habitat data collection, um, seed collection, uh, monitoring for EAB and more education and outreach, which is awesome. Uh, in 2021, we also have plans for an adopt a WISCO program under my project, uh, the Nujigalo Dohadajig Earth Keeper Network, to get some of the remaining seedlings to communities um, so that community members can be stewards in their own backyard of WISCO. 
So I'll get into some threats of whisk on <laughs> threats to WISCO. Um, so some of those are habitat loss from things like deforestation, development and agriculture, uh, climate change, I'll touch on that later. Uh, deer browse is a big one. A lot of the work uh, in I think 2015 and 16 that was done uh, to get some of these trees in the ground, a lot of that um, unfortunately kind of uh, fell apart because uh, you know the deer love to munch on uh, Wisco seedlings, unfortunately. So we lost a lot of our seedlings due to deer browse. Uh, disease invasive, invasive such as the EAB and of course over harvesting. Uh, the photo is a is a shot of uh, an EAB larvae, and we actually visited the the infestation in um, in Bedford, uh, I think, a few weeks ago, and we were able to peel off some of the bark with a draw knife. And unfortunately, we found a larvae in the tree, but it was a really great educational experience for my team because we got to see firsthand the impacts of the EAB um, on that stand. I think it was. Uh, I think it was green ash, but um, the EAB will uh, go after any of any of the native ash species in Nova Scotia. Um, so, you know, white ash, green ash, and black ash are all susceptible to the EAB, unfortunately. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the work, uh, some of the work that I did this summer, which is really exciting and, and new. Um, I had the privilege and the opportunity to work with um, the Department of Lands and Forestry and also the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure Renewal um, to conduct uh, and collaborate on uh, a WISCO mitigation project uh, where the Highway 104 is being twinned. So we actually conducted a transplantation of actual uh, Wisco trees, which was amazing and actually pretty unbelievable. Um, so there was a total of, um, I think, four trees that were, were that were transplanted. Um, the one on the left is one of them. Uh, so this was down the highway a couple kilometers from the wetlands that it was being transplanted to. Um, so it got loaded onto a flatbed and driven down the road to its new home. It's pretty remarkable to watch. Um, and the second picture is a is a photo of a stump that had been inadvertently cut by a by a landowner um, before the the parcel was was uh, sold and transferred to the province. Um, and that stump was transplanted to the wetlands, and it actually uh, produced stump sprout, which I will show you um, in a couple slides. Um, so, and then since since the transplanting, I've worked with uh, the rare. Um, rare plant ecologist, Dr. Nick Hill, and he's been mentoring me with um, the black ash and a lot of his knowledge on the black ash, which I've been just so grateful for. Um, so these pictures show us installing wells to monitor um, water levels uh, while the, the twinning is going on to see how that might be affecting their new home. And uh, the picture on the right, we're doing uh, photosynthetic tests um, to monitor um, uh, the stress levels on the trees that were transplanted, and uh, I've—I don't have a science background. I have a degree in Indigenous studies, so and uh, you know a background in Mi'kmaq ecological knowledge. So a lot of this stuff is is pretty new to me. Um, but I I'm really grateful the for the opportunity to to learn on the ground with Nick. And uh, you know apparently according to him, the numbers that we got from the photosynthetic tests were really good, um, which showed that the Wisco were actually uh, adjusting quite well to their new home. Um, I will say, uh, and I should, I wish I had pictures, but um, we did conduct uh, a Mi'kmaq ceremony to honor and to bless the trees before this happened. So uh, I facilitated that and I invited um, Elder Carrie Prosper from Bach and Gag First Nation to come and lead a ceremony with us. Um, I also had my aunt, Kathy Martin, who is a filmmaker, uh, come and pretty much capture the whole thing. Um, and she um, carries a song called Basket Maker, which she sang at the ceremony, and it was really beautiful. Um, and one of the trees still has a tobacco tie on it. Um, it had the tobacco tie on it um, all the way through the transplantation, and it's still on the tree in its new home. So it's it was really cool. Um, and another way that um, we've, you know, really um, incorporated to I'd seeing into our work at CMM uh, with with our Mi'kmaq ceremony and with our um, you know our Western uh, scientific methods, so 
it was a really awesome day and some of my colleagues were there with me too so um so yeah these are these are the four trees at the um site number two um and uh, we were basically just checking out the scene and figuring out how and the heck we were going to transplant these trees uh the picture the third picture to the right is a seven centimeter tree beside a maple tree so they actually had to fell the maple in order to transplant the wisco and the roots were like intertwined so they had to transplant the whole thing together um so it was quite the operation um the tree on the left actually was too big to be transplanted and it was harvested um for community use so uh these are some photos of harvest harvest day um i also had the honor and the pleasure of being able to um, prepare the logs for community um we had robert picto and uh anugwe picto i think i think he's picto too um, and they're from Bakken Gag, and they came and helped us to transport these logs to the community where they were actually immersed in a river. Um, and we did that so that um, the the logs would be preserved in terms of their um, uh, the you know the most optimal state for basket making. You want to keep them soaked and nice and wet until they're time to pound, time to pound the logs for the splints. But also we wanted to move it nearby because just in the in the case that there might be an EAB around, we wanted to make sure that these logs were put right into the water where we could immerse them and any chance that there would be an EAB on them, uh, that EAB would die, um, you know, from immersion in the water. So we tried to, to um, take the best precaution that we could um, to ensure uh, prevention of that. Um, even though there's really not anything developed yet with the CFIA and the Mi'kmaq Nation to um, figure out our best approach uh, in terms of um, harvesting ash trees for craft wood in in light of the EAB spread in Nova Scotia. Um, but we're we're working on that as we go, and we're developing that and setting new precedents as we go. So I'm really proud of our team for this work. It was really fun. Um, yeah. So this is our first little visit back to the site um, in the early summer. As you can see, uh, the stump started to stump sprout. Uh, we've got some leafing. Um, I think all the trees that were transplanted leafed out, which was awesome. Um, I'm just trying to kind of go quick because I, I don't know how I'm doing for time, but uh, I did want to uh, touch a bit on climate change impacts. Uh, I don't have a background in climate, uh, but this this image was prepared by my colleague Cheyenne McDonald, and it shows um, the impact of climate change uh, over the next uh 50 years. So, um, so I believe I had notes, but I can't see them. Um, so the green is where it's really abundant. Um, the blue is basically where it's, you know, struggling and it's less abundant right now. And the white is uh, demonstrating where there's zero abundance of Wisco in, um, in the Maritimes. So right now, um, I, I would like to share this with you folks. Um, so I am currently getting my splints from uh, Gescabagiag First Nation, which is a community in uh, in uh, Quebec. Um, and all the splints that I've been getting from Quebec are actually black ash splints, which I didn't know. Well, I thought they were white ash and I actually texted Stephen tonight and he told me that, no, in fact, all the splints that I sent you are black ash splints, which was really, um, it was really shocking to me because I thought that I was making baskets with white splints. Um, but I, you know, I really, uh, this graphic really uh, moves me because you can see that in the next 20 years, um, 20, 30 years, Gesca Baggy Egg is going to be impacted in the same way that Nova Scotia is currently being impacted by the Emerald Ash Borer, or sorry, by climate change. Um, so, you know, with climate change coming in, um, the habitat for, for Wisco is becoming less and less favorable. And while right now Mi'kmaq Nova Scotia can source our, our work or our splints from uh, other communities in Mi'kmaq, um, you know, in my lifetime, we're going to see that decline all across Mi'kmaq. Um, so yeah, I can, um, I'll just share with you, um, for those who haven't seen splints before, um, I can do a little show and tell. So this is what a, a roll of splints looks like uh, when you get it, when you get it from uh, Stephen anyways. Um, so he basically prepares the splints, he uh, rolls them all up, packages them up, 
And then uh, I have a huge box here full of them. And then he sends them to me. Uh, and from there, I can then uh, do my work uh, making baskets. So um, yeah, so this is actually all black ash. Um, and uh, I'm still kind of letting that sink in because it was kind of a shock to me. I didn't realize I was working with it. Um, but anyways, um, yeah, just this this graphic was really amazing to me because it just showed that, you know, while we're still able to kind of manage, um, we're really going to be impacted by by climate change pretty soon in a big way. And uh, we're going to be fighting this uh, in addition to the EAB. Um, so yeah, just a few qu a quick facts and some information on the EAB uh, in addition to what I've already discussed. Uh, it is an invasive native to Asia. Um, it ended up in North America around 2002. Um, it arrived in Nova Scotia in 2018. The first sighting in Nova Scotia was in Bedford. Um, so the adult lays the eggs on the bark um, and then the larvae borrows into the tree. It eats the, the cambium layer of the tree, which um, has a 99% chance of killing that tree um, uh, without a doubt after five years, I do believe it is. Um, when, they, when the emerald ash borer leaves the tree, it does leave a D-shaped exit hole, which you can see in this photo here. Um, which is an obvious sign of infestation. Um, other signs of infestation are epicormic shoots, which are shoots coming out of um, the lower part of the tree, um, and also crown dieback. So those are some some signs and symptoms of EAB. If you um, if you know of some stands um, of black ash or wisco or or green ash, um, those are some ways that you can tell that there's something going on there. Um, some of the, the control and management options are pheromone traps uh, and uh, inoculating um, trees with, um, with treatment. Um, I do believe there's also a wasp that they've been discussing introducing um, that will go after the EAB, but that's also an invasive. So, um, you know, there's pros and cons to that and a lot to consider. Uh, one big uh, message that uh, we can, you know, um, we can help spread um, as stewards um, is to um, stop moving firewood from district to district. Um, you know, the EAB can be contained in a log and, you know, we love, we love our camping and our hiking and uh, our campfires, but um, it's easy to forget. I'm, I'm guilty of it too, but um, if we can prevent moving firewood from region to region uh, and instead source our firewood locally, then that's a really great way to prevent um, the spread of EAB. Uh, it can move up to one kilometer per year naturally, which is pretty, pretty fast. Um, a couple more slides to end things off. Um, to date, CMM has successfully established black ash plantations at eight different sites. Uh, this is actually Cody's slide. I, I stole it from him. <laughs> um, so it would be more than eight now in 2020. Um, and there's multiple more stands being uh, planned for, uh, of course, we have the new one in Shubenaki Wildlife Park and uh, we'll be distributing trees for communities in the springtime. So there'll be quite a few more uh, in the coming months. Uh, uh, yeah, so we have thousands of seeds representing six isolated stands that have been collected and sent for long-term storage. Over 100 previously undocumented WISCO that have been identified and protected from incidental harvest uh, through the inclusion in the ACCDC database. And we have a better understanding of how to grow WISCO, um, uh, which has allowed for increased success with plantations and locating new trees. Um, next steps, um, working with our AFSAR grant uh, that will include surveys, inventories, and monitoring on habitat, tree health, of known stands, uh, seed collection, and collection of Mi'kmaq ecological knowledge on the WISCO uh, and education and outreach. Um, we also have, uh, you know, we haven't really started on this yet, but we've been having discussions about um, having community conversations about harvesting, um, storage, and uh, EAB monitoring. Um, so we really wanna come up with a plan for, you know, at what point in time do we actually harvest these trees that we know are infected um, and how do we store them safely for artisans um, that want to use them for basket making without spreading EAB further? Um, we're going to be running our adopt WISCO program in the springtime. And uh, one of my colleagues, Ali Vandergrift, who's actually on this call, 
um, is heading up a WISCO webinar series, which we're working on, which will follow the tree from, uh, from seed uh, all the way to basket. So um, these are some exciting next steps that we're taking at CMM. Uh, and I think that's everything. So uh, I'll just maybe take any questions if there are some. Well, Elio. Well, thank you so much, Hannah and Cody. And yeah, as you said, if anyone has any questions, now's the time. Okay, I think Matt has a question. <laughs> Hello. Um, Hi, Matt. Yeah. Well, Alan, it was very nice. Oh, I yeah. really enjoyed the talk and, and, uh, awesome. and uh, Cody's as well. Um, yeah, I had a question about Black Ash. I was, I, I'm actually on the recovery team for Black Ash. We just had a meeting uh, yesterday, so it's really on my mind quite a bit about uh, some, some things that came up, and your talk really mm -hmm. um, was great in, t in terms of um, getting me to think about some of the some of the things that we talked about. But one thing was about how much black ash would be used right now by the Mi'kmaq in Nova Scotia or by other crafts mm -hmm. people. Is there some uh, use going on um, of black ash, or has there been? Um, you know, I'm just wondering with with it not being that. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's not that prevalent in Nova Scotia. So is is that something that's happening? Or is it just in this kind of special cases like where the, that ash was um, mm -hmm. going to be cut down because of the highway? Um, just that's yeah. Thanks so much for your question, Matt. Um, I I think you know from just from uh, word of mouth, like just from speaking to my grandmother and some of her sisters are also basket makers. Um, it sounds to me like white ash, if if anything, is being harvested in Nova Scotia right now for basket making. Um, and of course, not every tree is optimal um, because the ring growth is just so much more variant um, than a black ash. It, you know, it's really, I, I don't remember the ratio of um, like how many trees you, you would have to harvest to get one viable tree for craft wood for, for splints. But I, I think if anything, yeah. white ash is being harvested. I don't know of any black ash being harvested in Nova Scotia right now. Um, most of the basket makers that I know of are doing what I'm doing and getting their, their black ash splints from uh, Quebec. So, um, you know, I talked to Stephen Jerome uh -huh. Sr. tonight um, about my splints and he said that they don't have a problem in Gescabeg yet with, with the EAB. So, um, yeah, I, all the basket makers I know are sourcing their, um, their black ash splints from Quebec. Yeah. So I think it's just in those off chances that you have a, a harvest like we did on the Highway 104 that um, logs are actually then being um, distributed to our um, our craftspeople and then they're producing the splints okay. for our basket makers. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Great. Yeah. No, that's it's great. Uh, one other quick question, if it's okay, just about uh, did sure. you see much insect damage this year when you were looking at? at uh, black ash leaves there where you were looking um up along the highway uh we had quite a bit of uh, insect damage on some of our trees not eab but uh you know we were looking at some uh lace wings and there was also some webworm mm -hmm. caterpillar and you know, there were quite a few of them had curled up leaves too so just wondering if you were seeing that further uh further east and north i haven't spotted any yet um but uh yeah nothing in colchester um that i've seen but yeah but i'll have to keep my eyes out for sure okay. this coming season can i comment on that yes please <laughs> it's not my job anymore but i used to be the black ash project coordinator um at the confederacy um i i did see them at at oxford in cumberland county um the leaves are curling up uh around the bottom of the tree um, and when you open the curled leaves, there was a um, some kind of, I think it was a lepidopteran larvae inside the curled leaf. And I'm not sure what species it was, um, but somebody from Acadia University did take a sample of it um, within, I think it was a, a Lambellavos lab. Okay. And I'm not sure Thanks. what came up. Okay. I have one comment from Ali. 
Um, she said the wasp that I mentioned isn't invasive, uh, which I think I said it was invasive, um, but uh, it, it would be introduced. Um, and they're testing it right now for its suitability to make sure it's not invasive. Okay, so it's going through rigorous testing. Thanks, Sally. Yeah, sorry, I just didn't want anybody to panic because oftentimes when people hear yeah. invasive species, yeah, it's they funny. automatically... Yeah, they automatically assume it's sort of like that Simpsons episode where they go to Australia and then they introduce the frogs and then they introduce the fox and then they introduce and I'm just like, no, 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 it's okay. <laughs> I went to rigorous testing, I promise. Uh, end up with all kinds of uh, species here in Mi'kmaq. Extra things we don't want. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, it's uh, the wasps, uh, and and in fact, um, CF Canadian Food and Section Agency is also working with um, our. Um, oh, what's Peter's job? Um, pollinator project. Pollinator project on some um, native ground uh, wasps to Nova Scotia that are also very interested in feeding on EAB. So um, mm. my little biological pest control nerd self is very happy and excited. But yeah, sorry, Hannah. I just was like, oh no, I don't want people to panic. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thanks, Ali Walalan. Does anyone else have any questions for Hannah or Cody? Hi, I have a question. Um, and thank you guys for very interesting presentations. Um, very stimulating and, uh, and really covered a lot of, a lot of ground there for me. Um, my question is the, on the adopt a Wasco uh, program that you guys are initiating. Um, is that going to, is the intent, to make that available to the general public eventually? Um, what's the thinking there? I think right now the plan is to um, to prioritize Mi'kmaq communities, communities who might like to have a whisk go in their backyard. Um, but I mean, in the future, I think that that's something that uh, we could consider for general public. Um, you know, I, we have a number of, of WISCO seedlings left to, to distribute for this program, but um, you know, if if we end up with uh, with uh, an excess, then that might be something that we consider. Yeah, I think it's great you guys have developed yeah. that expertise for sure. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, I have a question for Hannah. Um, how is the province dealing with the outbreak of emerald ash borer in the HRM? Hmm. Well, um, so we did meet with uh, Ron Neville from the CFIA recently, and uh, I believe that right now they're they're working on um, they have uh, the pheromone traps installed um, in Bedford to try to um, to capture the EAB if at all possible. Um, I don't think that they have inoculated any trees yet but uh i don't want to say that with with certainty but uh right now they're they are working with pheromone traps um which attract uh the eab um inside and i believe it's also a sticky trap kind of like um cody you said that your the hwa trap is like it's um they slide into it right then they fall they fall down into the the uh, collection unit so that that was for um, the other insects that are living right. in habitat as HWA, um, but it wasn't sticky. It was there was something slippery that made them fall. Slippery. In the right on. Um, yeah. So I, I think the the main method right now is using the pheromone traps, Chad. But um, actually, Ali, if if you um, have any more information on that. I know you've been pretty involved, so feel free to chime in. Yeah, and I just session. didn't want to hijack your guys' conversation because no. you're doing so well. <laughs> no, um, I mean, I, look, I'm still building my expertise, so um, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I yeah, I guess for have any more information. Yeah. yeah, I guess for everyone on the call, my background is biological pest control management, so this is like, you know, this is an area that I'm very comfortable with, but I just, I didn't. Unless I was invited, Hannah, I don't want to. I don't want to sidetrack the conversation or take anything away from anybody. So I appreciate the the ask. Um, uh, they are trying to set up monitoring. So there is a quarantine area right now in Bedford. Um, so 
most, uh, if not all of the infested trees that they know about have been identified and are, they're, you know, very careful about um, people moving branches, moving, um, uh, moving firewood, um, cutting down any of those trees, et cetera, because they will have to be dealt with at some point. Um, and the, um, they are injecting some of them with triazin, which is a, um, a pesticide that gets injected right into the tree and it's systemic throughout. So anything that feeds on it is going to, um, to have, be impacted by that. Um, but, uh, as most people who deal with invasives know, early detection is kind of critical. So what they're doing is they expect it is elsewhere already. They just don't know. So they're trying to work with us to find the spots uh, where there is really good ash stands um, and working with the community members on training them to do monitoring um, with the pheromone trapping. Uh, and the pheromone traps, they are the three... Uh, three-sided triangles and they're they're quite sticky because if if you get them if you get them in a truck and you try to peel them apart it's an absolute nightmare <laughs> um and so they hang those up in the branches um and they're also doing sampling like hannah said with the with the knife you score the side of it and you hope and you can hopefully see the little lar well not hopefully but if you do you can see the little larva inside and then you know that that tree is infested um, we have had some concerns that they might also be down like Bear River way. So like oh. all of this is to work with Canadian Forestry, uh, or sorry, yeah, Canadian Forestry Service and um, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency in identifying where it's spread, wh what stands it's already impacting, um, and doing that early monitoring detection as much as we can and getting our community members on board with that because some of them don't even know it's a threat at this point. So that's, anyways, that's my <laughs> my, ten, my 10 cent chat on EAB. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, um, Allie. I live in Bay River, so I'm very sad to hear that because we're already dealing with oh. an HWA outbreak. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, Basically, we were we were in Bear River for the harvesters gathering, Chad, and uh, we we had our little uh, not it's not a goodie bag because it's not good. It's a EAB EAB bag <laughs> that Cody gifted me before he left CMM, <laughs> and it's got like you know vials with EAB samples in it and uh, some you know some wood pieces showing the the boring. Um, but yeah, we were we were showing this to some community members who were you know woods woods people. And they were like, hey, I think I've seen that. Like, we're pretty sure that that's what we saw. Cause they, I guess they found like a beetle that really looked like it. So um, yeah, we're, we're talking to Ron about maybe getting some pheromone traps down in Bear River to, to confirm that, or at least gather some more information on it. But um, we're hoping that that wasn't the case, but, and it was just a lookalike, but uh, yeah. Very sad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I have I a had question. Somebody, oh, yeah. go ahead, Cody. I was just saying, I had somebody bring me a little vial one day uh, when I was working for the CMM, um, and they thought they had caught an emerald ash borer um, in Millbrook. Um, so of course, that was a concern. So I went down to see it, um, and, and luckily it was a six-spotted tiger beetle, um, which of course also has that really nice shiny green um, color. But it was kind of, kind of alarming to hear that yeah. at first. Yeah. Yeah, you hope for those false alarms. <laughs> um, yeah, so Cody, I did just have one question for you. Um, you looked at the vegetation in your study sites, and I was wondering, are you seeing any of the other tree species starting to regenerate after the hemlock has started to thin, like in the Sisabu site? Um, so the, the hemlocks haven't declined to that point yet. They're okay. still at the component. Um, but th there certainly are seedlings growing up on the forest floor. Um, but a lot of them are hemlock seedlings, and they're also infested with woolly adelgid, um, which is really hard. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. If there <laughs> are <laughs> no more questions... Uh, once again, I'd like to thank our speakers, Hannah and Cody. That was an awesome talk, very informative. I loved all the different perspectives. It was, it was so rich and beautiful. Um, 
And of course, I'd like to thank our funders, the Region of Queens for supporting MTRI seminars and Venture for Canada for supporting my work here at MTRI. And I'd like to thank our audience for joining us tonight. And um, I hope they join us again on Wednesday, December 9th at 1230 for our last Lunch and Learn of the year, where Amanda Lavers from Parks Canada will be giving an introduction to the Christmas bird count and exploring some of the common birds that everyone might encounter when they're out looking for birds. So if anyone's interested in joining that, they can use the exact same Zoom link uh, they used tonight. And uh, we hope everyone is well, and we see you again very soon. Thank you.